Tonight, we're going to talk about uh, connecting online safely. And we have a very illustrious guest here. Um, and uh, Larry Maggot's been uh, a writer for longer than most of us have been alive. Um, and he's been on uh, syndicated programs. Uh, I was listening to at dinner, him talking about how he was often uh, doing more than one per day uh, for, for 25 years on radio um, and always at 351 uh, every day. Uh, for five, and he still still looks, you know, like he's not all burned out. Somehow, rather, uh, writing many, many articles a week. Um, and the most exciting thing is he's working with all of the big social media companies on how to improve um, the way people um, uh, think about how, how to, to safeguard, especially kids online. And so um, this, this, um, this abstract that's in front of you um, describes a little bit of that, but go to connectsafely.org to learn more about it. And what we're going to do is we're going to give him, you know, uh, 50 minutes, I really want to, or whatever he wants, um, want you all to pipe in, ask questions, uh, confront anything he says. Uh, I'll do a little bit of that. And also to um, to think of questions for when we're done with, with our normal, um, normal banter. Um, and um, with that, um, I'm, uh, we're lucky to have um, the illustrious uh, Larry, Larry Baggett. And um, you can sit here and and uh, I'll wander off. Thank you. Oh. Thanks, Deb. Pleasure to be here. I think I want to start a little bit about how I got involved in internet safety. It was actually born of tragedy. Uh, as some people in the Bay Area may remember, in 1994, I think it was, um, yes, it was 1994 because it's, it's the anniversary. Uh, a 12-year-old girl in Petaluma named Polly Class was kidnapped. And although she eventually was found to have been murdered, there was a period where there was a search to look for her uh, in the hope that she was alive. And uh, I learned about this as I was driving my car on Highway 101 from Redwood City, where I was living at the time, down to San Jose, where I was meeting with folks, I think it was Netcom, one of the early internet providers, uh, for research for a book I was writing called... Uh, Larry Maggot's Guide to the New Digital Highways, a random house book. And as I was driving my car listening to the radio, I heard the story about Polly being kidnapped. And the, they say that there is a volunteer effort going on in Petaluma and that people are being encouraged to come to Petaluma and to pass out leaflets to help find Polly. And I literally pulled the car off the road. I said, whatever I have to do at Netcom can wait. I'm going to turn around and drive to to San Jose, to Petaluma, which is about 80 miles north of where I was. And it struck me that maybe I should continue to drive to Netcom because maybe there's a way that I can help look for Polly without having to pass out paper leaflets. And so I went and had my meeting with Netcom and I ran it by them. I said, could you help me distribute this leaflet? And by the way, I, I, I had a car fight, a brick phone at the time, and I called the center in Petaluma where they're doing the looking for her. And I asked somebody if they had a modem. He didn't know what it was. But there was a techie there who did know what a modem was. They did have a leaflet. Somebody there had a scanner and they sent me a copy of the leaflet. Well, also at the time I was writing columns, in addition to a LA Times column that I had been writing, I was also writing for the Mercury News. More importantly, I was writing for Prodigy, AOL, and CompuServe, the three large online services I was doing computer columns for all of them. So I had a great distribution network. And it occurred to me that we could use the internet. And at that point, I wasn't thinking so much internet, the online services to distribute picture to Polly. And so I organized that. And um, Time Magazine got a hold of the story and did a, an article about it and called me and the two guys that were helping me, working with me at High Tech Heroes, which was Certainly, we weren't heroes, but we were doing what we could. And suddenly, I started getting calls from all over the country from parents and grandparents of missing children. And I said, way, this is way beyond my uh, capacity. So I called up the uh, CEO of the National Center for Missing Exploited Children, who I knew, Ernie Allen, and said, Ernie, you're, you're, the, you're the organization that knows what you're doing in this field. You need to do something. And we organized 
what eventually became missykids.com or gypsy.org to, to look for kids online. And that was the beginning of that. Now, the reason I bring this up is that Ernie invited me to be on board of the National Center. And a few years later, now actually about a year later, uh, we talked about me writing a booklet called Child Safety on the Information Highway. Kind of stealing a term, I think, that Al Gore you know, had the, the information highway. And we published this booklet. And we released it at Comdex with a big press conference. Steve Case from AOL was there. And I think Louis Free, the head of the FBI, was there. And of course, I was there. And Ernie Allen was there. Nobody showed up. It was a complete failure. We got no press. But a few weeks later, there was a potential kidnapping. There was a child from Seattle who had traveled down to San Francisco and met with a man. And there was a search for this boy, this, this, this 17 year old and child. And suddenly, child predation was front page news and around the country. And this booklet that got no attention was flying off the shelf. And the National Center had to keep reprinting it and reprinting it and reprinting it. So it became the first widely circulated um, article or bulletin or brochure about how to stay safe online. Uh, probably wasn't the first one, but it was certainly the first widely circulated. I believe, I don't know if they printed millions of them, but certainly many, many. The date for that was? Uh, it came out in 1994, first edition. And it was, it was reprinted, I think, all the way up to 2000. They kept it, kept it going with various updates. Um, and somewhere shortly after that booklet came out, Steve Case and I talked about, Steve Case, as some of you may know, was the founder of AOL. He gave me some money to start safekids.com, as did Network Solutions and a small seed grant to start safekids.com, which still exists. It right now leads to Connect Safely. And I started publishing and doing updates on internet safety. And in 2004, I'm fast forwarding, MySpace was a, a thing. But also, there was a TV show called To Catch a Predator. And there were attorneys general all over the country raising hell and high water about the dangers of the internet. At that point, there was also a little bit of research out there, which said that the probability of a child being sexually harmed by a stranger who they met on the internet was extremely low, far, far lower than the probability of them being harmed by a relative, by a teacher, by a clergyman, by a police officer, by a doctor, by anybody was in a position of authority in their personal lives. It was very, very low. But the probability of other harms, like cyberbullying, for example, were much higher. And so the movement to protect children was so focused on a condition which, though serious, was rare, failing to focus on a condition which, though less serious, was common. And that led me and a colleague to start what is now connectsafely.org. It actually started out as blogsafety.com. We kind of mis, misjudged the marketing uh, wording, but later we were able to get Connect Safely as our name. And part of the reason that I started it was a bit of a mea culpa, because a lot of the paranoia around internet safety was based on what I wrote in 1994. People were still, by 2004, circulating this booklet, which I had written 10 years earlier, which had information based on the complete lack of research at the time, a lot of speculation, and a lot of fears. And so I spent the last, now, 20 years of my career trying to, in some sense, undo what I did in, 2000, in 1994, because I wrote a booklet and gave advice based on gut reactions and instinct, but not on research. And so connectsafely.org is a research-based organization. The advice we give, the threat landscape that we analyze is based on research. So when we say something is problematic or dangerous, it's probably because there is data suggesting it's problematic or dangerous. That doesn't mean we don't speculate. For example, we don't know if generative AI is going to be dangerous or not. But we do provide people with advice on how to use it in the safest possible manner without contributing to the paranoia around the so-called existential threat that it may or may not pose, because we don't know yet. And so while caution is always important, it's also important not to have a moral panic. And moral panics around technology have been with us for a very, very long time. What do you think of um, 
uh, Gary Marcus's um, daily rant about the dangers of, of uh, generative AI? Well, I mean, I think it's, it contributes to the hysteria along with that letter that with that statement that Sam Altman, of all people, the head of OpenAI, and uh, Bill Gates and a lot of other technology leaders have signed, calling it an, a threat, an existential threat on par with nuclear war and climate change. I just don't believe it. I mean, I think it's potentially dangerous, but I don't believe it's helpful to take a, a technology which is in its infancy and start talking about climate change and nuclear war. I think it's helpful to think about how we can develop it and roll it out in the safest possible manner. I think it's helpful to think about privacy standards. I think it's helpful to talk about consumer education, but I don't think it's helpful to talk about an existential threat that we don't know yet exists. Could it exist? Sure. But there are lots of existential threats that could exist. But to talk about it in those terms, I think is, is, is inappropriate, in my opinion. But as I said, there's a long history of moral panic. So the first case that I'm aware of, I'm sure the first case had to do something with fire or the wheel or the rock, probably the rock, probably some cave woman was saying, you know, Henry, be careful with that thing you're using to break things up because if it falls on baby, it's going to kill baby and probably did kill a few babies. Uh, but we don't have any historical reference about that. But we do know that Socrates in about 400 some BC said that writing was very dangerous because it would interfere with human memory. And he warned us to be cautious about writing. Uh, we, of course, know about the printing press and the concerns not only that the scribes had because it was going to cost them jobs, but the clergy had because A, it was going to cost them jobs, and B, they were worried about uh, information overload, which we still worry about. And so the printing press was definitely a bad idea. The loom was a very scary device. In fact, it caused mass panic by the Italian uh, workers uh, who, uh, whose jobs it was replacing. The telegraph, not only was it a concern about the people who, whose jobs were at stake, but there was huge fears about information overload and about its effect on mental health. And as is the case of many uh, inventions, its negative effect on women. A lot of misogyny and concern about protection of women and children. In fact, the railroad, everybody knows that the railroad put a lot of people out of work. But what I didn't realize until I did the research is that there was a term called railway, railway madmen, theorizing that anybody moving as fast as the railroad train could take them was going to have psychological instability and would be a danger to themselves and others. And once again, women were warned to be very careful if they were in a railroad car, because it's very likely that one of the men on board the train is going to attack them because they would have gone insane as a result of this uh, high-speed transportation. Telephone is another example of a, a product that scared the bejesus out of many people, including, again, going back to misogyny, the concern that women would have frivolous phone conversations and would not be productive in the home and would therefore not be doing their wifely and motherly duties. So, you know, we can move on to the computer, um, Y2K. Remember Y2K? It was going to be the end of the world. My son was getting a haircut around 1999, and his barber was telling him about how she was storehousing food and how she was, you know, collect, you know, hoarding flashlights and batteries because she was convinced that the world was going to fall apart January 1st. 2000. And my poor son was so petrified that we never went back to that barber. She was our barber for years. Um, but that was another very famous example. There have been many examples, even 9-11. After 9-11, the rate of death per mile of travel went up because people were so afraid of flying that they were driving places they would normally fly to. And as everybody knows, rate of death per mile in a car is higher than a rate of death per mile in a plane, even when you factor in 9-11. Still, it's safer to, to fly than to drive, but more people died because they were afraid of flying. So there's such a long history of this moral panic. Um, and there's also, as I indicated when, when in the start of Connect Safely, or we, as we began, the focus on the wrong things. Now, another mea, mea culpa. When I wrote Child Safety on the Information Highway in 1994, and when I wrote my first book on telecommunications called The Electronic Link, also about that same time, I think it was 95, 
for some reason, it didn't occur to me to warn people about nation states using technology to try to overturn elections. It just failed to get into the book, any of those books. Um, it didn't occur to me to worry about um, mental anxieties as a result of going on social media and finding out that someone else seemed to have a better life than you did. Just never crossed my mind in 1994, 1995. To be honest, my first book on, um, on the internet and actually on online in 1995 didn't even have a section on security. And I think a teeny bit on privacy. A few years later, I wrote a book and I did cover those topics, but not in the kind of depth that you would cover them today. So, you know, clearly there's a lot of things we didn't think about. So one of the dangers of focusing on things that you can imagine are dangerous is the possibility you may fail to focus on things that actually turn out to be dangerous. So, um, that was kind of, you know, as I say, my introduction to this field and, and what I'm now trying to make up for in some ways. Um, one of the things that really is interesting is the way threats emerge. So, for example, at Connect Safely, we just published a parent and teen guide to generative AI. It was not on our radar a year ago. I mean, generative AI existed a year ago, but it wasn't in the public sphere. It wasn't until, what, November, October, when ChatGTP came out? The people started thinking about it. It became a thing. And now it's a major factor of, it's almost everything we do has an AI component to it. Something we didn't think about just a few years ago. Um, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, extended reality. By the way, I'm gonna take everybody's picture here. These are smart glasses. And we actually did write a book lit, a brochure a guide, uh, a bystander's guide to meta glasses because the camera. I don't think there's much danger to me wearing these glasses, but there is danger to people I encounter if I were to be irresponsible about the use of the camera. Of course, that's also true with the smartphone. But the mere fact that cameras are everywhere and now we're wearing them and some people have them on their wrist creates a threat factor that we weren't thinking about just really until months ago, a couple of years ago. Um, misinformation, disinformation, didn't make it into my early writings on internet safety. But now uh, we have a guide uh, to, uh, we used to call it a parent's guide to misinformation and fake news. We had to change the title because the term fake news got co-opted. Fake news now means real news. And the term that I meant by fake news, we're just calling disinformation or false news. So we had to change the title if a certain former president uh, co-opted that term, unfortunately. It's about as political as I plan to get tonight, but you never know the, the evening's young. Um, civility was another thing we didn't think about very much back in the 90s and early 2000s. It's now a huge issue. It's a huge issue for children. And of course, it ties into civil, to cyberbullying, but it goes way beyond cyberbullying. It goes to the issue that there is on the internet what, what is called disinhibition. The notion that the person you're talking to isn't really a person. You understand intellectually they're a person, but emotionally you don't fully understand they're a person. And it reminds me of road rage. A number of years ago, I was making a left turn into a parking lot and I inadvertently cut someone off. I made a mistake. And the guy who I cut off started cursing me, started uh, giving me the finger, was just absolutely livid at this mistake I made, which didn't cause an accident. He recovered, nothing happened, but he was angry. I rolled down the window I said, you know, I'm so sorry that was clumsy of me. Please forgive me. He said, ah, don't worry about it. So while I was sitting in a 3,000 pound car with the windows closed, I was this anonymous stranger who he just thought was the biggest jerk you could imagine and he had a license to curse me out. Once I rolled down the window and he saw a human being apologize, all was forgiven. I was just in Manhattan and whenever you walk around Manhattan, except during the pandemic, you're likely to bump into people because it's real crowded. Rarely, rarely do you see a fist fight break out because somebody accidentally bumped into someone. You say, I'm sorry, they say no problem, and you move on. On the internet, with disinhibition, where you don't have that human connection, it is so tempting or so easy to lash out at that person. And so incivility, I think, is a major issue. In fact, it's become such a major issue that at least two companies I know of have vice presidents of civility, Roblox and Snapchat, have renamed their safety officers civility officers. Microsoft was doing that for a while. 
So it's really become a big thing in the internet safety field, and it should be. And not only for children, by the way, for all of us, especially during an election year, it's really important to recognize that those people who we disagree with are still people. And whether or not we approve of their politics or their, who they're going to vote for, they're human beings. And I think we can disagree, but we should do so without being disagreeable. And it's, that's a lesson that I think parents need to learn, all adults need to learn, and of course, children need to learn it as well. But I think children are actually, for the most part, better behaved in that regard than many of us are. Uh, security, I think, has become a huge, huge issue. Scams. A day doesn't go by. Well, let me ask the, the audience here, how many people have been, have been the victim of an attempted, not a, not a successful, an attempted scam in the last week? Every hand went up. Every hand went up. I probably could have said last hour if you happen to be looking at your phone, right? I mean, almost a, an hour doesn't go by that I don't get an email or a text. Most of it's picked up on my spam filter. Some of it gets to me where somebody isn't trying to, you know, take, separate me from something, my money, my information, whatever. Uh, it's becoming a huge issue. One issue that we're warning uh, parents about and teens about, especially teenage boys, is sextortion. So... Believe it or not, and I know this is going to come as a shock to you, teenage boys have an interest in girls and boys in some cases, and they have an interest in sex, strangely enough, and they love to look at images of people of whatever gender they're attracted to, typically female, not necessarily, and criminals and other scammers or scammers have, are onto that, and there are organized crime syndicates largely operating out of Africa, but not exclusively who are preying on teenage boys. And the typical scene is, you know, you send me yours, I'll send you mine. And they send an image of themselves that's inappropriate for mass distribution or any distribution except perhaps to an intimate partner. And that person who may or may not be female probably isn't, um, certainly is not interested in them, will then use that image to threaten them with public exposure if they don't pay a ransom. And I first, when I heard it, I said, what, boys? I always thought it was girls that we needed to protect from sexual exploitation. But this particular scam goes against, I mean, mostly at boys, not exclusively, but mostly at boys. And some boys have paid the ransom. A few boys have committed suicide. Many boys have been anxious. I got a call, oh, about three months ago from a friend of mine whose 18-year-old son, who was going to school in New York, I think at NYU, had been victimized. And he was a kid who had some mental health issues to begin with. And my friend was extremely worried about his son. And so I called his son up and I talked to him and I gave him some advice on how to try to get the stuff down. And I actually used some of my connections with Medic that had been posted on Instagram to help get it down. But I also said to him, you know, this is a real bummer. I said, first of all, we're not sure how widely he's gonna distribute it. But even if he does, I guarantee you 20 years from now, you're going to be fine. You're going to look back at this. You're not going to laugh. You might even cry, but you're going to be way over it. And he needed to hear that. He needed to hear that the world was not going to come to an end just because some naked pictures of him were possibly being circulated on the internet. And that's important too. We need to put things in perspective because if we overreact to things and get suicidal or depressed or anxious, overly anxious, that has potentially more harm than whatever it is that happened to us. So um, I felt good to be able to make that call, and I felt good to have written uh, through Connect Safely a, a guide to sextortion, where we point out that here are the things to watch for if it happens and hopefully avoid. Here are the things to help recover if it does happen. And here are the things to think about if the worst does happen, that it's really not as bad as it may seem, as bad as it may be. And that's really important on sex station. Um, screen time, another issue that has gotten a lot of press lately. At one point until a few years ago, the American Academy of Pediatrics had this recommendation of no more than two hours screen time per day. I'm not sure for what age group. I think maybe all the way up to 18. I'm not sure. But they had to revise that for a number of reasons. One reason is they revised it. They revised it away. They, they no longer talk about hours. They talk about sort of similar to the way you talk about substances. Does it interfere with your life? 
you know, does it get away in, get, does it get in the way of schoolwork, of family time, of athletics, of social time? What is the screen time? It's sort of like the debate about television. There's a difference between Saturday morning cartoons sponsored by sugary cereals and Mr. Rogers dating myself, which my kids watch when they were little. So you have to look at what is the screen time? What are they doing? Are they simply scrolling or are they contributing to social media, for example? They may be part of, a, of an interest group, a forum where really interesting things are happening and they're challenged. They may be isolated. They may be LGBTQ, living in a community where there are very few people, uh, like-minded people in their community, but they're connecting with people, allies and friends around the country, around the world who can support them in, in, in what it is they're, they're concerned about. They may be a religious minority getting support or, or, or counseling from someone anywhere who appreciates and supports what they're going through. Uh, they may be a hobbyist. They may be a student. They may be an athletic, uh, you know, interested in a baseball team or a football team. So those kinds of activities are very different than scrolling endlessly through TikTok and have been shown to have less alienation and more productive. So when you talk about screen time, you can't talk about quantity. You also have to talk about quality. And then finally, something happened in March of 2002. And, and no, March, God, my time, 2000, called the pandemic, right? Yes. And suddenly those evil screens became our lifelines. If you want to go to school, you better be sitting in front of a screen. If you want to go to work, you better be sitting in front of a screen. If you want to talk to grandma, even if she may live around the corner, you better be sitting in front of a screen. And that, I think, changed a lot of people's attitude towards screen time. But having said that, there's still a problem. There's still people who are so obsessed. I don't call it addiction, and the psychiatric and psychological authorities don't either. But there is problematic behavior around screens. People who are spending too much time, including kids, including children, including teens, and not getting out there and doing the things that they should be doing. Yeah. So, you know, I know China had this thing a year or two ago. He said, hey, you know, we got we to gotta, we gotta get these kids off these games. Yeah. And we're going to limit it to two hours. How has that worked out for them? You know, I really don't know, but I know it won't work in this country. It won't work in the U.S. And it probably won't work in Western Europe or most other countries. And it certainly wouldn't work in Korea, although Koreans have been challenged by, over, by gaming. Um, there's so many problems with that. One, the fact it's the government, which in China is no, not a problem, I guess, but it would be certainly here. But the other is it's arbitrary, kind of like the one-child policy and other Chinese rules that are just arbitrary, not taking into consideration everything that I just said. I mean, gaming, I don't know. Obviously, you don't want to spend 12 hours a day in a game. But on the same token, if your child's playing a video game, you don't want to say, Johnny, get off the computer right now any more than you would go to a soccer game and say, Johnny, Susie, get off the soccer field right now. He's engaged in something or she's engaged in something. They have opponents that they're, that they're interacting with. They have teammates that they're interacting with. They're strategizing. It's perfectly reasonable to say you only get an hour, you only get this much time, but it's not reasonable to treat it as a trivial activity because it's no less trivial than any other activity that a kid might engage in. And it's been shown that computer games, actually the military loves computer games, that high end eye coordination comes in really handy when you're trying to change, train soldiers. But uh, it, it has a lot of benefits. So I can't really comment on how it's working in China. I have not looked into that. But I don't think it's going to happen here. And I don't think an arbitrary limit like that is going to work. Um, boy, hate speech is another area, too. Oh, probably 15, 20 years ago, I remember driving down to or flying down to L.A. to debate the head of the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. And... He was saying we need to abolish hate speech online. We need to do something about all these Nazis and white supremacists and anti-Semites. And I disagreed. I said, no, we want to counter hate speech with good speech. We shouldn't interfere with people's right to speak. I disagree with you. Respectful debate we had. I'm not so sure I was right about that. I'm not so sure he was 100% right about that. But I think we have come to a point where we've seen that some of this hate speech has translated into actual real-world violence and discrimination. 
uh, it's translated into some very serious emotional trauma for a number of people. It's probably contributed to the rise of anti-Semitism. We are seeing a growing increase in, uh, in homophobia and transphobia. We're seeing a growing increase in misogyny. Um, I'm not so sure that that hate speech that I was not defending, but saying we need to simply counter it and not ban it, I'm not so sure it's, it was as unharmful as I thought it was. I don't know the answer. I still believe in the First Amendment. Uh, I still believe that you, it, 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 you don't ban speech just because you disagree with it or it makes you uncomfortable. Um, I completely celebrate and respect if somebody wants to go on social media and support candidates that I despise. I think that's their right, maybe even their responsibility as citizens. But when we are getting to the point where we literally are condoning Nazism, anti-Semitism, racism, I think, I think we need to push back. And that's why I'm critical of my former, I wouldn't call him friend, but, but Elon Musk, who I used to admire greatly, um, I think he's gone too far. And I think, you know, by completely eliminating moderation or at least largely eliminating moderation, I think he's gone too far. And I think that, that that's kind of where we are right now. I was listening to, I think with Bill Maher, somebody making the point that the right's gone too far, the left's gone too far. That we have to do something about cancel culture, both from the left and the right, and they're both guilty of it. We have to do something about um, how we approach um, accuracy. It's mostly the right that's guilty of that, but not completely. And there's a lot, there's a lot of kind of rethinking we have to do to kind of not necessarily get to the middle ideologically. I'm, I'm all for people having a wide range of political opinions. But, but in terms of how we treat each other and in terms of how we express ourselves, we need to rethink. And unfortunately, we've had a very bad role model uh, in or more than one very bad role model in high public places. And I, I think that that's done real harm and I think it's played itself out on the internet. So I think hate speech is a real issue. And again, that's one of the things that we weren't even thinking about back in the, uh, in the 90s. We started thinking about it a little bit in the early 2000s. Um, at the same time, there are attacks on free speech. There are those who would suppress us. I'll give you um, examples. Uh, Texas wants to compel social media companies to carry anything that someone says, if it has anything to do with politics or even ideas, even if it's hate speech. Ironically, that is requiring someone to speak. And requiring speech is a violation of free speech. Free speech means you have the freedom to speak or the freedom not to speak. And those attacks are attacks on free speech. Book banning, which we are seeing going on, and you know, trying to suppress internet sites that are publishing things that you're not comfortable with, that are not obscene, that are not violent, that are not you know, something that you would necessarily even ban children from, is becoming an issue in this country. And I think we need to really think about how we counter this notion of cutting off ideas. And again, I don't care if it's left or right. Ideas should thrive and should, should flourish and should win or die based on how useful they are. Um, so I think that, you know, we live in a, we live in a time when, when we really need to kind of completely rethink what it means to be an inner safety advocate. Uh, we need to think about extended reality. What does that mean to be in a virtual world? where the emotional impact of something is much more intense. So if you were to confront me on Instagram, that's a reaction I may have. If you were to confront me in Horizon World, where you and I or our avatars are inches away from each other, that's going to have a bigger emotional impact on me. I have already experienced it. One of my first times in in Horizon Worlds, which is Meta's um, virtual reality social environment, somebody was yelling at me and raising their fist at me and jumping up and down. And I literally got a visceral sense of fear. I knew that I was safe, of course, but intellectually, but emotionally, I was afraid. And there are numerous reports about this. Yes. Uh, Jeffrey Perone asks a question. As far as um, issues like hate speech, what do you think of the Center 
uh, for a humane technologist approach to regulating the algorithmic amplification of aid speech. Yeah, that's an interesting. I, I, I've looked into their, their I think that they have a point. I think they do have a point. I think an art, a case could be made, even though I'm a strong proponent of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which basically says that online services are not publishers and they are basically forums, essentially, and therefore you shouldn't be able to sue Facebook because Ted said something that was horrible. I'm not sure that applies if the algorithm has amplified what you said in ways beyond just the fact that you said it and I was exposed to it. It does make some sense to me. Now, I know that my friends in the industry are not particularly happy with uh, the Tristan, what I can't even name the guy who runs that organization. Um, but, you know, they're not particularly happy with some of his critiques. But I do think that algorithms should be looked at if, in fact, they're unleveling the playing field. And they are. You know, if they are amplifying content, which, while it has a right to exist, doesn't necessarily have a right to be, you know, thrown in our faces. Now, one of the issues with algorithms, and I don't know if it's a bug, pardon me? One more question. Sure. Um, can you give some examples of, uh, good examples of level playing fields for communication that ex have existed? <laughs> Wait, no, I don't know, fully level playing fields? Do you, you have something in the telephone? The telephone? Yeah, now that everybody can afford one. Uh, it didn't used to be. You know, the, you know, the old public, the reason, one of the reasons why Dewey was supposed to be Truman was because more Republicans had telephones than Democrats at the time. So the pollsters were getting it wrong. But yeah, the telephone is a good example. Um, you had another one. You said copier? No, no, the common carrier. The legal yeah, the common carrier. Um, but again, it's a, it was mostly a one-to-one -one communications medium. If you think about any of the mass communications mediums, anything from plays to public events to television radio newspapers you know the public the, it was freedom of the press for people who own presses um now there was yeah so i'm not sure i can think of one of a mass public thing where it was a fully level playing field it's a very good question it was tristan harris that's the tristan harris that's right tristan harris yes who was the uh the leader of that group but the, the thing back on algorithms people say Twitter is a cesspool. Actually, or X. And I, I've seen evidence that it is. But my Twitter feed, for the, with the exception of Elon Musk, who somehow shows up everywhere, I'm not seeing much of that stuff. The people who I follow, the people who I interact with, are not behaving that way. Same thing's true with, 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 with my Facebook account. I don't see very many obnoxious, negative people. I see a few, but not many. So the thing about algorithms is if what they're doing is if they're basically keeping you into an eco chamber, that's supposed to feature in a bug. It's a feature in that it's giving you a place where you're comfortable. It's a bug in that maybe it's giving you a place where you shouldn't be comfortable. So in the case of the extreme people, you know, anti-Semites or whatever, if it's, in, if it's increasing their bigotry, I think that's a bug whether they do or not. In my case, I think it's a bug because it's isolating me. It's keeping me from understanding what the full ecosystem looks like. I don't see that stuff, and I should see it. It's a little like, you know, somebody, my wife was um, in Haiti, in, in an island off the coast of Haiti doing some volunteer work, and she complained that when you stood at the beach, all you saw was garbage in the water. By her definition, what's that, Caribbean, I guess? By, from her vantage point, the Caribbean was a pretty ugly, disgusting, dirty place. I have been to some Caribbean islands where it's just absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. So is the Caribbean clean or is the Caribbean dirty? You know, it depends on where you're standing. You know, it's both. So you can't generalize. Um, I'm not sure that answered the question. But, well, but, but the fact is that algorithms, I think, do create a buy. But on the other hand, I have to tell you, I turned them off one day. I actually, uh, you can go into Facebook and you can actually make it so that your feed is purely um, chronological and you see everything. It was boring. There's a reason why they do it. It makes it more interesting. So part of that, you know, they're, they're onto something in doing it. It makes it more interesting, but it also deprives us of a broader view of what, what's going on on the internet. 
Any other comments, question? Yeah. Yeah, please. Say your name. Uh, <clears throat> Richard Miller. Hi, Richard. Hi. Uh, so you talked about, uh, we read articles online, and every every title now is clickbait. I, yeah, I, I almost don't care where it comes from. Yeah. There's something wrong with all, and we sit there and we chat about it online with my friends. I'm like, they take the most obscure thing, they amplify it in the article, and then they put it in the title, and then you read the article, and it's nothing like that at all. Right. And so even I've had you know very close friends say things to me based on only the title of the article as if that's the fact. Right. In fact, when you read the article, nine times out of ten, it has the actual facts in it, nothing like what you're reading in the article. And you talk about civility. Not to mention the pretty girls that are sometimes showing you. In, well, in, in, there's yeah. examples of that too. I mean, yeah. there's a picture of Gene Wilder next to the guy from the beef, the the bear, the bear, yeah. Jeremy. Uh, he's from you know TV show, and they say, "Oh, read who's you know relatives of each other," because they do happen to look like each other. Mm. They're not related They're at all. Really. They're not even in the article. Yeah. Well, you know? two, I have two comments <laughs> about that. Slight pushback. One is not all articles. I, I mean, I don't think that okay. every publication is guilty of that. Yeah, uh, sure. For the most part, mainstream media, so, with the time in the post. Or, yeah. But on the other hand, there's nothing new about that. Yellow journalism headlines going back to, you know, the Hearst Empire. Um, well, before. Pardon? I, mean, I think that there wasn't really even a consensus that it was valuable to be truthful until kind of New York Times kind of said that. And, what, 1915, 1914? Mm. Uh, I mean, before that, it was pretty much whoever owned the publication's opinion. Got to think. But it seems like everything is page six now. Everything is... Yeah, yeah, no, it's... Well, know. the thing is, there's more of it. And the other stuff, especially if you, if, you're, if you want to stay away from the paywalls, there's a lot of junk out there. I mean, there's some good stuff that's not in paywalls. I mean, I think CNN's pretty decent. I think that there are some pretty decent... Guardian's still free. But more and more of the good stuff behind paywalls. And that's the problem. They see the headlines, but they can't even get to the article. If you, I should say they, we, because I don't subscribe to everything. I subscribe to a lot of things. Um, but but I, I think, you know, one of the reasons why I pretty much stopped writing for Forbes, and I did write for them for years, is that they pay by the hit. And it really bothered me because it was a, it was a incentive. Now, they have rules to try to prevent clickbait. But they also have seminars on how to write compelling titles. And uh, but the point is, I didn't like the idea of being incentivized to get lots of hits. It just wasn't my it's not where I come from. I mean, I, I wrote for twenty years. I wrote a weekly syndicated newspaper column in the L.A. Times. It was also in the Washington Post and other papers around the world. And to this day, I can't tell you how many readers I have. Uh, but you are proud of having been in those settings because you know that those get millions and millions of people read. Well, millions and millions of people read the papers, but but not. I don't know how many of them actually yeah. turned to the business section to read my column, but the point is I didn't know, I didn't care. I mean, I cared, but I didn't know. I don't even think the newspaper knew. All I know is they kept me there for 20 years, so I must have been doing something right. And and in fact, one of my competitors, he wanted to say, put out a, a statement that says, I have 33 million readers, and he based that on the fact that or, 30, or whatever about million readers, he based that on the fact that the number of newspapers, he took the pass around circulation of the number of newspapers that his column appeared in. And based on that math, I had actually two or three times as many readers as he did, but not presumptuous enough to assume that everybody who touched one of these newspapers actually read my column. I mean, maybe, can't prove it, can't prove it happened, can't prove it didn't happen, but today you can. The point of it for knows exactly how many people have read every article I've written. And how far they get in it. And how far they get in it. And whether and whether they subscribed based on it. And whether they referred somebody to it. I mean, the metrics are overwhelming. And so the economic incentive to do the clickbait is enormous. And, and it's disturbing. And I don't know what you do about it other than try to, I wouldn't say restrict, but try to focus your attention on websites that you know and trust and believe are not doing that. But you know, at the end of the day, everybody's got to promote their product. In fact, that kind of reminds me of another comment I, I neglected to bring up, which is addiction. 
So there is a more than one bill going through legislators. You know, every state in the country is legislating internet safety these days. There's more than one bill attempting to go after internet addiction. And the one that I read just two, three days ago would ban any uh, activity that encourages children to remain online. Oh. Now, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Should Hershey's make their chocolate unflavorful because they're encouraging people to eat it, knowing that some people are going to be tempted to eat a Hershey bar who have a disease and might kill them? Some people are going to eat far too many Hershey bars and maybe get a disease that might kill them. But other people are going to have one or two a day, a week, whatever works for them and go through life fairly helpfully. And maybe if it's dark chocolate, it might even benefit them. And so this notion that you can't do anything to incentivize a child to use your product, what would the toy industry be if that, if they, if they, if that were outlawed? What would any industry be if you basically said you can't make your product appealing to users? Now, maybe there's a difference between some subtle algorithm that manipulates people into staying online longer versus a product that's just so enjoyable that people want to. I don't know where that line is. Maybe there is a line, I'm just not sure. But I do know that we don't want to make, make fun against the law. We don't want to make it against the law to, to engage in activities that you enjoy. You know, um, at least most activities you enjoy. There may be some that we should outlaw. and certainly some that have been that are now legal. But the fact of the matter is that I, I worry about those, the unintended consequences of those laws. Yes. Yeah, the nicotine based. Say your name. My name is Bushran Tanda, I work at Other Lab. Uh, yeah, the nicotine vapes, I'd say, is a great example for something that should be outlawed because it, it is so incredibly addictive and now they make them in all these flavors. And right. We all ate as children as uh, candy and now they're. Right. And it's not only addictive, but it's harmful at any dosage. Yeah. So you can't make the case that a moderate use of nicotine is okay. I mean, I'm not suggesting that one drag on a vaping is going to kill you. But it's not help. It's 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 clearly harmful. We can't make that case for social media, not across the board. No, no, I would In fact, the opposite. The opposite. We can make the case that some social media is extremely helpful. And obviously, the chocolate industry would argue that chocolate in moderation can be healthy. The wine industry argues that. Although interestingly enough, most of those studies are funded by the wine industry. But they make the case. But the point is that. Oh, the chocolate studies. Yeah, the chocolate studies are as well, of course. And the social media studies are as well. Um, and in all disclosure, Connect Safely gets financial support from some of these companies. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that, that we can point to many examples of pro-social activities that happen in social media, as we can point to examples of antisocial and dangerous activities that happen. So, you know, that was a walk down memory lane. Um, Emerging technologies, I mentioned extended reality, I mentioned uh, GAI, uh, generative AI. Elon Musk recently implanted a chip in someone's brain. That's been science fiction for centuries, decades at least. It's happening. Um, is it evil? Or is it true that this guy who has some kind of severe disability is now able to do things? That, sure, what is disability? Is it epilepsy? Well, whatever it was, he's able to do things that he wasn't able to do. Scary, yes. Potentially pro-social and beneficial, maybe. Speaking of Elon Musk, self-driving. I'm a minority here. I actually just bought my second Tesla and waited until they were allowing me to keep my self-driving software without having to repay for it. It's 12 grand if you want to buy it now, but I got to get it, keep it, not have to rebuy it. I think that self-driving, even at its current state, which is horrible, in terms of full self, in terms of state title, makes me a safer driver. There are huge campaigns funded by a billionaire. I can't remember the guy's name. He's spending bought Super Bowl ads, claiming that it's dangerous, and it probably is dangerous. It is dangerous if you rely on it. If you're not walk, looking out the window and you don't have your hands on the wheel and you're not paying attention. But when I change lanes on the freeway, I love the fact that there are eight cameras looking out for me. And if I and my car is not going to change lanes until the cameras all decide that it's safe to do so, because I don't trust myself. I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake. I haven't yet, but I've come close. It's never even come close to making a mistake on that particular maneuver. And so, 
you can condemn it if you want. I applaud it. And I use it, but I use it cautiously. I use it, you know, I keep my eyes on the road and I recognize the fact that it's far, far from perfect. Yeah. I think it's the same thing that you mentioned earlier with the comparison to <laughs> driving car. Hmm. Okay. Why versus, versus the airplane. You were talking about yeah. you know, people's perception of the car versus not going an airplane is the same as the perception of self-driving versus driving. I, I'm sure that we're all going to be, you know, not hack, all going to be safer drivers if you take the human out of them. Right, <laughs> right. Well, and also when you think about airplanes, I, I, don't, I haven't looked at statistics, but I bet you if you go back to shortly after the Wright brothers, the fatality rates on airplanes are probably higher than they are in cars. I don't know this for a fact. Does anybody know? Well, that's why human factors was invented because every plane had different controls and the guy would jump from the one military plane to the other and he would push the throttle forward, you know, put the wings forward to go up and it would put him right in the ground because they flipped the controls on the plane. It's funny you say that so, because going back to Elon Musk, this new car that I bought yeah. yesterday, yesterday, I, I picked it up last night. It's five o'clock. Took it for my first drive today. I drove to Oakland and back from Palo Alto. In order to shift gears, you have to go to the touchscreen. And yeah. let me, let's see if I get this right. Up is drive, down is reverse. I kept getting it mixed up. I, uh, luckily, I was being slow. When you want to put on your turn indicators, there's no stock. You know, that thing you push. There's a there's this little button on the steering wheel and you have to remember that the top is left. I get the right? The bottom is right. Oh, I literally had to look at it every time I change lanes take. I wasn't I'm not I, I don't have muscle memory for it yet. So we're back to but where we're the higher interaction designers, not graphic design. But on the other hand, maybe the world, you know, so Elon Musk eliminated the stock and we're laughing at him. I laughed at Steve Jobs when he eliminated the floppy disk. And then he eliminated the, the he eliminated the optical disc. And I laughed at him then. I'm sorry. Yeah. The headphone jack. The headphone jack. Right. Keyboard we, on the phone. Exactly. I remember saying, "Oh my God, I can't type on glass." So at some point, you do have to break the envelope. But again, I mean, it's funny you mentioned the airplane because that's exactly what I'm dealing with right now. After what 60 years of driving a car, 50 years of plus years of driving a car. Although when I first started driving, it was these hand signals. But having to unlearn and relearn how to how to signal for a lane change, how to shift a gear. So you know, it's, it's interesting that up is on, on the stock, up is right and down is left. Yeah, and I, I and I may be getting it wrong, but I that, that, that's how it is, right? And maybe yeah, that's and maybe, as, and maybe that's the way it is. I actually yeah. see that's the problem. I don't uh, again I have so a few hours I've well if, in terms of behind the wheel, I have two hours experience in this new car. <laughs> And I, I don't, I can't remember, um, but I'll figure it out. Hopefully it'll become muscle memory. And hopefully the next time I get in a rental car, I won't do it wrong. <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, that's that, the, the reason why I'm bringing this up, except for I'm obsessed with it because I just bought the car, is that's the nature of the world we live in. We have to break things once in a while. You've got, I mean, you, you know, you, you have to innovate. You guys in this room, that's what you do for a living. I'll give you another interesting comment. And I know some of you are early Apple people, so you may disagree with me. But I remember when I got my first Macintosh. And I remember looking at the desktop, the virtual desktop. By the way, we're off the subject of internet yeah, safety. If that's the only reason you're here, thank you very much. Have a great night. Come to connectsafely.org. I'm back on Tuesday. I remember when I got my first Macintosh. I, was, I had a Mac. And, well, let me back up. Be back up before the Mac. And I was around during that whole time. Steve showed it to me before he you know, made it public. I, I had a PC in my office in, in San Francisco. I had a PC in my home in, in, in um, Redwood City at the time. And I needed a file for my home computer. So I called up my wife, who's techno, not technically savvy at all, didn't use computers. They said, do me a favor, hon, go to the office, turn on the red switch on the right side. Um, I think we had hard drives then, so I didn't have to tell her to put a floppy in. Um, I said, when the screen comes up, I want you to type PC talk. That was my communications program. And then I want you to do this, and I want you to do that, and I want you to do this. And suddenly the file came up. It was very discreet. And very, very, you knew exactly what to tell her to do. Fast forward a couple of years. 
Same scenario, but we're on Macs. I said, hon, turn on the Mac. Um, do you see an icon that looks like a microphone? Where is it? I don't know. Wherever I left it. Where is it? I don't know where it is. And eventually I, she found it and she sent me the file. But the point is it was much harder. And one of the reasons it was much harder is because Apple did too good a job replicating the desktop. So, for example, on my real desktop, at home, I might throw a piece of paper somewhere, right? This paper belongs in a filing cabinet. It's a place for it. There's a home for it. Now, it's not where it was the night I went home tired. But in, and so when Apple built the computer desktop, they replicated that exact same thing. That's a bug, not a feature. You can have a mess on your desktop. You can have a mess on your physical desktop. And if I had, if I were extremely wealthy, I would have a secretary come in every night back in the day of disk, and I would have had that person put my files back where they belong. So the next morning they would be where they belong. And of course, computers can do that, but Apple chose, and of course, Microsoft's doing the same thing with Windows, to allow you to mess up your desk and leave it that way until you clean it up again. They make the assumption that the way you leave things is the way you want things. That is the exact opposite of the way I live my life. Well, I mean, they're back in 1981, uh, Bill Burke wrote a paper comparing a uh, deterministic graphical user interface versus one that you rearranged and found that people could get more done more easily, more quickly by having a deterministic one. Well, that is where the things are where they're expected to be. And you find them exactly the same place every time rather than the ones that you So why did Apple and Microsoft do it differently? I don't know what Xerox did. I mean, well, no, that was Xerox. That was Xerox. So if Xerox had actually done their job and marketed the computer, then the GUI might have looked differently. Well, they did every damn thing. They yeah. were experimenting too. Yeah. They had fights within themselves. So why did why did Apple and because they didn't know better? <laughs> That's why they didn't. They really, literally, you know, they people make decisions. It's like what he he, he mentioned. Uh, Richard mentioned something about we need interaction designers, not graphic designers. I mean, not not, not yeah. And and that I maybe mean, used it. Well, I, yeah, I meant that that problem. Is a known problem that's been solved over and over again by the car industry by the designers of cars. Until until Elon Musk came along. Well, yeah. my my I had a car that did it. That had four buttons for uh, the windows. This was in the nineties, and it was one, two, three, four in a serial row. <laughs> what's what's the second button? Yeah. What's the third button? I actually had a gear shift button in the in the seventies. Eh? The Plymouth yeah. had gear shift, but yeah. But yeah. but his point is that now they're typically arranged as an array of two by two, two for the left side and two for the right side. Mm -hmm. And it's very obvious which ones are behind and which ones are in front. Mm -hmm. and, and people have known to do that some, somewhat. And the main thing is that our, our tie is about testing things to find out if they're right. Right. Do you design things? You don't just, it's not feed forward, it's feedback. And you have to, you have to iterate and talk about, uh, there's other ways parallel design works too, but the main thing is evaluation. But then you got the QWERTY keyboard versus the Devora keyboard, right? Like the sure. keyboard that we're stuck with was designed to keep keys from crashing into each other on sure. physical manual typewriters. But we, we, for whatever reason, can't make the shift. Nor can we make, in this country, can we make the shift to the, to the metric system, which is much simpler than the system. So simpler, the, the question is, I, I one time I got a chance to present a bunch of user interface ideas to Lou Gerstner, CEO of a you know, billion dollar company. And he said, these are beautiful things. Beautiful. I love all the things you say. But aren't we better at the things we know how to do already than things that we're going to have to learn and we don't know yet? Yeah. Well, that's the reason that a lot of these standards have value in spite so, of the fact that we can argue that they are. I was um, really good at using floppy disks. <laughs> I, I, I just, I, you know, <laughs> until Steve took them away. <laughs> I'm curious now. I believe in your Devorah example, but. Now that I have a phone and my fingers are less than 10 millimeters away, I wonder whether I would have that same performance now that I touch type with two fingers, as opposed to the distance I need to carry. So you're saying that maybe in the, in the end it was actually better. No, I think now it might, might be moot. I mean, I know for me, research. for me, I can, I can type at 100 words a minute on a, on a regular computer keyboard. I can't type at all on a phone. I'm horrible. I still am. I can touch type on this. No, it's good. I'm, I'm impressed, especially Practice. a guy who's more than 30 years old. I'm, right. I'm impressed. I'm assuming you're more than 30 years old. Um, you might dye your hair gray. I don't know. I do that often. You look like you have something to say. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there's a question over here.
you know, there's so many examples of, um, of, you know, where we try to replicate the past and, you know, you get the familiar, it's sort of like saying, you know, the, the best word processor you can use is the one that you know, or whatever, whatever sure. product, you know, um, so. It's got, it's got its value. The metaphor, there was a uh, Stu Card and, and Tom Moran wrote a paper uh, where they showed that if you said, before you start teaching a person the text editor, if you said, this is like a typewriter right. versus, you know, which is something they know versus yeah. these are good keys and type, type yeah. you're, you're thinking it, people learn it much faster. So yeah. metaphors do help. Metaphors no, I agree. I used, I used the typewriter metaphor for decades. Well, years, certainly. Now, I guess by decades, it, it was worn out. Now you'd have to explain what a typewriter is. This is like a computer, but <laughs> I don't know. It, but what's the difference? It, oh, it, it, it doesn't require power. There, there are versions of it that are, you know. Just imagine on that, on that uh, Windows DOS version that you've stuck your file somewhere mm -hmm. in a folder, and now you have to go find that file, which means you have to navigate up and down paths and you'd have to know the name, exact name of every path, or you'd have to go directory and then find the directory versus double clicking, expand, 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 ignoring search for the moment, right? And so there was trade-offs that yeah. they made and you can definitely make a mess of your desktop. And that is a waste of your energy. Yeah. Like it is an overhead oh, that you shouldn't have to pay. I probably you know? spend minutes a day Closing windows because my desktop is just oh, too messy. Yes. Yeah, which is which How about is, browser windows. Fifty oh, yeah. But although I must say I do a better job doing that than cleaning up my physical desk because I, I still have a messy physical desk too, <laughs> which I don't clean up regularly and should. Um, but yeah, I, we, we waste we're wasting a lot of energy on stuff we shouldn't, from a design perspective, have be doing anything. It's just overhead. Yeah, you know, I wonder. Like, I was let me go back to safety for a second, but not completely discussion. I was, I was talking to, to Ted on the way over, knowing that I was going to speak to a group of people who are innovators, designers, engineers, creators. And so this is more a question. This is more like I'm turning the tables on you, wondering how you can design, you know, there's this term of um, safety by design, privacy by design, security by design. People say it all the time. I don't think people really understand what it means. You know, how do you, I mean, people say it, but they, what does that mean? How do you do it? What is safety anyway? Well, that's another question. I mean, am I safe? Well, you've heard these, I've got a list of safe my, from problems or am I safe to, to, to be able to do something? Yeah. Well, that's true. Well, they, they have a great example. I'm sorry, what's the name of the other one? No, no. What's the name of the product? Um, the cooktop. Uh, yeah, it's called, uh, it's called Charlie. Uh, the company is called Tanning Street Copper. Tanning Street Copper. Okay, so they're they're making an induction cooktop. Mm -hmm. One of the classic human factors problems that we used to show, like when we teach class, but when they would put the gauges, you know, to turn the heat on the back, on the back wall. So mm -hmm. that means you have to reach over your hot pots mm -hmm. in order to turn mm -hmm. on or off the thing. Obviously, we all can recognize this just simply by the tone I'm using. Yeah, here. of course, yeah. But so safety and design in that example, you know, was about putting them in the front and creating that metaphorical but that's, I mean, design I thought, so that you knew the left one went to this one, the middle of this one went to that one. Usually so they were offset a little bit. Okay. Right. So there's all that's safety. It's funny because when I bought my induction, so my second one, my first one, I didn't do this. I made sure I bought one that had a cook timer off for every burner. Are they called burners anymore for every um, heating element? I mean, yeah, we're trying to find a cooler name yeah. for that. But, we, we even but, but I know that I'm very forgetful. So I, whenever I'm cooking, even if I don't think I'm going to forget, I always put a timer on there. So I'm probably going to still burn whatever I'm cooking, but I'm not going to burn the house down. And so, and, and I recently bought a, um, what was it called? A, a grill, a, an indoor grill. And I couldn't find one that had a real timer. They all had timers, but they were weird. Like you couldn't turn them on until after the preheat. No, no, I want to make sure that come hell or high water, this thing turns off in 20 minutes. You know, if I'm, I couldn't find one. So I had to buy an external timer to plug into it to make it to, to, so I could have my. So so our solution to that yeah. is that we have a temperature readout. So no matter what, if it exceeds the same. It shuts down. So See, whether you set the timer or not, you cannot go into it. That's great. Well, I, where, where do I get this product? <laughs> Hey, uh, I think you know that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. No, it's, it's got a, a battery back. I, in fact, I used ChatGTP to try to find one with a timer. And what happens? I ordered a couple, and they all had timers, but none of the timers actually did what I wanted. So, so let's go back to this. This you're making this wonderful stove. It's got a battery backup for the house. It's, it's got many good things about it. Um, but what would it mean? What would be the value or not value uh, as with computers of being uh, having an API where I can dive in there, add my own ideas, my own algorithms like his, uh, put, a, put a physical object on it, uh, hook it up to it so that it, it's controlled by some, some other piece of hardware. Is, is that, is that, you know, is there any, you know, that used to be the way things were made. Motors, you know, you hook them up to anything. Internet of things? Yeah. No, I, I hear you. Uh, I come from like a, like a huge kind of, uh, I stand on the shoulders of a lot of open source projects, and so like I really respect that. Um, but like you know, some of the things that we built today uh, with our appliances and high voltage stuff that we're dealing with, then just like inherently more dangerous than like a lot of the things we've worked with in the past. And so uh, internally, we have these discussions of like. Do we open source our battery packs so they could do something else with the battery that's in their stone? Do we enable other kinds of fire uh, saving resources? So, if I, if I heard what I heard you say, is you're scared that you'll make a dangerous object if you give them control and power? Is that? Is that yeah, it? No, that's exactly it's why. Exactly why GPT. That's what AT and T said when they were monopolizing the telephone network and made it a felony to hook up equipment to their network. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing you for your concern, you're right. But the unintended consequences of that. No, we're yeah. taking the conservative approach here and just trying to be safe about this thing. It's a, it's a first of its kind kind of product where you have a very large battery and an appliance like that. This does not exist. Um, and so we really wanted to not scare people and not have any kind of a bad experience. And so this, so we're like, Indexing hard on the like really safe, really good experience side of things, well, and think, then we might open it. No, I think yeah. I think that's how a lot of people go, and I I only brought it up because it's a common question. Yeah, no, it's not, not because no, it's a great question. Question. no, it's a really good question. Um, no, and 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 the world is full of examples of that. Like for example, the difference between an automatic transmission and a standard transmission. Standard transmissions are easier to drive. But I'm sorry, no, automatic transmissions are easier to drive, but standard transmissions are easier to fix and easier to do marginal, edgy things that are, you know, if you want to go up a sleep hill or something, or bet, you know, so it's like the, the trade off of, of fully automated. I think about that a lot. Yeah, like when I was in the early days comparing the Macintosh to MS DOS, I mean, I was able to do enormous amount of customizations of MS DOS without even being a programmer. Just using batch files and macros. I wrote a book called The Fully Powered PC. I co wrote a book uh, without any programming, just amazing, powerful things. You couldn't do that with a Mac. But it didn't mean the Mac wasn't a great computer. It just it did, it could do other things really well. Yeah, an Apple script did take 25 years to show up, I think. <laughs> right. Um, and I, I still don't think that this, so, um, obviously, designing for safety in my life. Peter um, didn't speak. Peter learned from other things. Um, you know, different ways. Uh, I, my early years were actually quite thinking of the type of market. And obviously, this is a very dangerous thing to do. Um, and it's quite interesting that once people started dying, the only thing that didn't die, so a little bit later on, a lot of people did start dying. And they were most, mostly actually teachers. Teachers were particularly prone to dying. I had some of my theories about why. Teacher of the, of, the, of the sport? Or just, yeah, yeah, teachers of the sport. And a lot of it is because they had very singular knowledge in a very specific place. And they, they thought they knew what they were doing, but they had very little experience in going outside of their regime. Mm. And so as soon as they went outside their regime, they would do something stupid and die. But um, a lot of the type of safety I would be looking at, and this sort of comes into regulation as well, if you can design something that is inherently safe, Ideally, you want to design things that inherently don't need regulation. If they, you know, at a fundamental level, you want to not have the problem there in the first place. And that's very difficult, but in some small areas you can do it. For example, one thing in physical things, other things, uh, when you're trying to do something, so I will try to make things not be too heavy. 
because the, the larger the thing is, the less damage you do. So then people can do stupid things and get away with it. And that is something that we sort of underestimate. It's like if you go you know, drive the bicycle around, as long as something doesn't run into you, you'll be okay. If you go well, you could fall off of it and break yeah, your neck, and yeah. you could. But if you drive your tank around, yeah, right. You can cause well, a lot more damage to everything else around you. Although it's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, but I, but I but I would rather be in a tank than on a bicycle Definitely. if I'm crashing into something. I mean, I I don't want to be the person being crashed into, but if I'm the crasher, I'd rather be on the. You know. I mean, that's the six thousand pound Tesla approach. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, in fact, one of the problems in our highways is that there are so many big cars so, that they make small cars inherently more dangerous just because pure pure weight. So I, I have done a lot of stupid dangerous things in my life. And uh, luckily, I haven't been seriously injured, but I want to actually ride bicycles around urban areas. Well, the funny thing is that I give you an example. I the one time I had a serious enough bicycle accident that I needed surgery. Um, I had just come down riding thirty miles an hour down Sand Hill Road, and I was riding on Waverly in Palo Alto, actually right by Steve Jobs' house, and my bike wheel got flipped on a leaf, and I fell down at probably ten miles an hour. You know, just tooling around residential street and broke my elbow, you know, but when I was riding 30 miles an hour down that hill, I was really paying attention. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that was safer, but I was more focused on safety at that moment than I was when I was tooling down the street and, you know, slipped on something. So, so there's two things I want to comment on what you, what you said. First of all, uh, there's a lot of uh, small cars that have uh, better, better safety ratings than big cars. And in fact, sports yeah, utility vehicles are well known to be much less safe for the occupants as for well the as occupants the because they tip over and there's a lot of and they have uh, worse characteristics in in dangerous and slippery situations. Yeah. Well. yeah. And uh, with respect to the second thing you said, um, it's very common when you don't pay attention is when you get hurt. And and uh, I'm thinking about kayakers. I don't know if any of you have ever kayakers, but when you're kayaking. You're going down these big rapids, you know, big waves and holes, you're, you're being tumbled about. And then you get to this calm place, and there's this thing called an eddy line. And it's where it really looks calm on one side of it, and on the other side is where you are. And when you cross this eddy line, the, 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 the stream's direction changes, and it flips people every time. You ever been there? Yeah. <laughs> So it's, it's a very common thing. You let down your guard. Yeah, every time I've had a serious injury, it's been doing something that was seemingly safe. Most of them walking downstairs. As I say, riding my bicycle 12 miles an hour. And every time I've done something, quote, dangerous, rock climbing, flying, cycling at high speeds, I've been fine. Now, that's anecdotal, but, you yeah, know. You also walk down along the stairs and you probably rock climbing. Yeah, that's true, too. But, but, <laughs> but I think that the, the, what, he, what he brought up, and I think it's absolutely right, is attentiveness matters. Yeah, right? exactly. We, and, and, and I guess, you know, trying to bring this back to justify why I'm here, that kind of is a great way to close in a way, because if you think about internet safety, attentiveness matters. Uh, is, is thoughtfulness, is presence, you know, it all matters. And I think I think in terms of you know, the use of technology, we are going to do things, you know, we're going to build GAI. If anybody's listening, doesn't know that term, graphic generative artificial intelligence. We're going to build more extended extended realities. I, I mentioned all these glasses I'm wearing. Uh, huge potential, huge implications for bad things that could happen, uh, including misinformation, um, obviously including privacy violations. But being thoughtful, um, you know, matters. I mean, if Henry Ford had put more thought into the implications of what he was designing, would our cities be cleaner? Would our roads be safer? You know, would our air be clean? Would our air be cleaner? I don't know, but it wouldn't be any worse. I mean, it would have been nice. Maybe he did put some thought into it. I have a feeling not enough. You know, um, and eventually Ralph Nader came along and shamed the auto industry to doing something that made it much better. Still not great. But better. So, you know, I, I do think it's important. One of the things that I was going to talk about earlier and I never got around to is stakeholders. Uh, one of the things we feel very strongly about at Connect Safely is that it's a village. There's a role for individuals, there's a role for children, there's a role for parents, there's a role for anybody who's a user of technology. 
There's a role for industry. And believe it or not, my friends in Silicon Valley, there is a role for government. And sometimes people overstep their bounds and get in the way of things and gets messy and not so clean. But um, I really do think that, you know, we need to figure out how everybody can do their part. Um, and talking to some engineers in the, in the room, there's also a, real, a, a role for innovators. I mean, if you're going to design a car, you might want to put brakes and airbags in the first edition. For some reason, when we design tech products, we often forget the brakes and the airbags. You know, why would you put a brake in a car? People don't buy cars because they can stop. They buy cars because they can go. So what's the purpose of it? What's the purpose of brakes? What a silly thing. Why would we bother? I'm surprised Tesla had one, knowing Elon. But uh, no, seriously, in a way, in a way, the tech industry, he's with a regulated industry, so he didn't have no choice. But I, I often worry, wonder why the tech industry, uh, you know, we want to make things, you know, Facebook's motto used to be move fast and break things until they give you a big corporation and they broke too many things and they had to slow down a little bit. And, uh, you know, kind of where I'll leave it. So thank you so much, Larry. It's thank great you. to have you. I'm Ted Selker, chair of Baykai. I'm uh, really appreciate you coming. And uh, I'm sure that we can continue this conversation a little bit uh, afterwards. But for that now, this is um, this is the end of today's. Next... Um, Next next month we're probably going to visit um, um, something five. What is it? Uh, Switch five, and uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a field a field. Uh, uh, we're going to get to go out. And, yeah, we're going to get to go and, and see um, Jerry Man uh, Jerry Ellsworth's uh, company, and she's going to give a talk. She's incredibly engaging. Uh, it'll be south, so people from south can get get a little bit uh, uh, get to be there. And for that, for now, uh, thank you for being here, and I'll see you next month. Thank you.